Brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you to this morning's study. I want to thank you for your time, and I look forward to your contributions in everything that we are going to cover. Before we come into what the Lord would present before us, shall we seek his guidance, ask for his blessing, and thank him for his providence that we may learn what he would have us to know at this time. Will you join me now in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for this opportunity we have to join together, to come before you, to learn more of you, to seek you, and to be blessed by you. Help us now, Father, to gather together. Help us to be joined together in unity so that we may go forward doing that work that you would have us to do. Open our minds today. Help us to understand that which you would have us to see. We ask, Father, that your will is done and that your character may become clear to us so that we may clearly reveal your character to those around us. Help us now. Direct us. For we thank you and we praise you. In this, Father, we ask that your angels join with us and that your spirit is striving with each one of us so that our hearts may be open to the ways in which you are leading. Help us now. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, in bold before you is a statement by Mrs. White from letter 121 in 1903. Now, as we're going to consider this statement, I'm going to ask a question. What is the standard consideration that we have had of the gospel? How do we describe it? Okay. So in this situation, what when, when we are describing the gospel, how do we normally describe this? There's a phrase that we've used many times. Well, the so, everlasting gospel? No, deeper than that. Okay. Well, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's one. Is is the gospel a three-step prophetic testing message? That's what I was saying, that when I said the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates classes of worshipers. Okay. <clears throat> In the bold from letter 121 of 1903, Mrs. White wrote, when those claiming to be Seventh-day Adventists are converted, when they return to their first love, they will begin to work to save perishing souls. Can you see three steps in this statement? Mm -hmm. So what is the first step that needs to be taken? Converting. Now, why is that important? Thank you, sister. Who is to be converted? Perishing souls. Okay. But her statement is stating when those claiming to be Seventh-day Adventists are converted. To their first love. Because they've left their first love. Because they the, the second part of the statement says that they must return to their first love. Right? Yeah. Uh Now, those that are claiming to be Seventh-day Adventists, is she not saying that they are unconverted and that they are in need to be truly converted? Well, if you've gone away from your first love, um, uh, yeah. Now, when this is done, then those that are converted... Those that have returned to their first love will begin to work to save perishing souls. If we are unconverted, have we returned to our first love? And can we then begin to work to save those perishing souls? Now, many people try to put the cart before the horse. I've heard many times, you know, if you want to be converted, you know, if you want to be a Christian, you want to have a good spiritual life, just start working on you know, evangelism, right? Okay. Right. 
No, it, it is true that, you know, when you're seeking to uh, minister to others, that, that it does help your spiritual walk, right? I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're sharing truths with others and you're studying, hopefully, you know, in order to do that. But if we are not converted and we're seeking to save people, we actually are going to be powerless to do that. We might be able to get them into a church. We might right. be able to get them, you know, into a ministry. But the, the main point is that people need to be saved from their sins. And, and that's not going to happen if we're not converted. Right. And so we need to be converted because we're not. In this, in this kind of a situation, when we're tying this with the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, mm -hmm. can those that are unconverted, that have not returned to their first love, can they give a message before the ancients at the house in Jerusalem? No. Not at all. We need to seek conversion first, just as we need to seek justification first. When we return to our first love, and what was the first love of the Millerites? Was it not understanding the prophetic message? Well, uh, yes. I mean, it, I mean, if you look at William Miller, it was, I mean, studying God's word. Right. right. So, I mean, that includes the prophetic message. Okay. Now, once Miller was converted, once he was no longer a deist, and he began to understand what the word of God was saying, and he began to love the prophetic message, did he not begin to work to save perishing souls? Mm -hmm. We are told that we are to study in the same manner in which Father Miller did. Father Miller was converted. Father Miller came to understand what the first love meant. Father Miller worked tirelessly to save perishing souls. So not only are we enjoined to study as he did, we are to work as he did. She continued in this letter, I am making earnest efforts to win the crown of life, which at the last great day, the judge of all will give to those who love his appearing. Let not our lips be tarnished by unbelief. Let us talk the truth. Let us refuse to be deceived by the seducing spirits that will come. Did those who met in the upper room after Christ's ascension have a conversion experience? Did they also not establish their first love, leaving behind the teachings of men and holding on to the teachings of God? And once that was done, did they not begin to work to save perishing souls? In all things, Christ has compared the end with the beginning. We are to understand what it means to have the upper room experience because we've already been given the example of the upper room experience. The movement today has not had the upper room experience because we are not fully converted the lord has light and wisdom for his people which they should expect receive and cherish now isn't that interesting they should expect one receive two cherish three let there be cited decided changes made let those who have been accusers and who have stood ready to take offense at any word or move that seemed to them to be ill-advised, humble their hearts and pray that the spirit of division and dissension may be taken away. The Lord has a work for all to do who will submit to be worked by his Holy Spirit. This letter is completed, or this, this thought is is fulfilled in this second paragraph. Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled. 
yet the time is passing and the people are wide awake, asleep. right? No, they're asleep. Does she say just a small number are asleep or is this that all of the people are asleep? If we're going to be watchmen, we need to be waking people up. The people refuse to humble their souls and be converted. Not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have such great and important truths revealed to them, but who refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience. The time is short. God is calling. Will you hear? Will you receive his message? Will you be converted before it's too late? Soon, very soon, every case will be decided for eternity. What does that ha- what does that say to you today? Have you not seen elements in this paragraph in what we first were addressing at the outset of this message? Mrs. White is making it very clear. Conversion from accepting the words of man is of first priority. We need to accept the words of God as first priority. We need to be as Father Miller, searching the scriptures. Does that mean we're just to search the Old Testament and the New Testament? No. What did Father Miller search? History. Yes. But his Bible at that time were the Old Testament, the New Testament, and? Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha. Now, here we are. Father Miller has passed. Ellen White has passed. James White has passed. But yet, all the studies that they left for us, what we would consider to be the spirit of prophecy, remain. Are we not to study, as Father Miller did, meaning that we study the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Apocrypha, and the spirit of prophecy? Amen. Now, when it comes to the Apocrypha, though, I mean, we have to, we have to recognize that it's not equal with the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. It has information that we need to know that's in there but it it doesn't have the authority that that the rest of that the scriptures have well, what was it that ellen white had to say about the apocrypha again she did speak to this well she said there's things in there that that uh, we need to we need to know we need to study very early on in her ministry she was given a vision with the apocrypha mm-hmm. and she did call it the hidden book Mm-hmm. But she also stated that the wise would understand. Yeah. Yeah. So there are things that that we need to understand from the Apocrypha. Now. But there are things in there that, that definitely are not uh, part of Scripture. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask the basic, que- the basic question, why is it? Why was it decided not to be included as part of the canon of Scripture? Okay. Being inspired. That that part is historical because in 1611, when the James the, the King James Bible was published, the decision was made to publish the Bible and have the apocrypha between the two testaments. Yeah, and partly that is because a lot of it covers the history between the two testaments. Correct. Now, it wasn't until 1827 that the decision was made by the British and American Bible societies to remove the Apocrypha. Some felt that it was more Catholic and they wanted it to have a division from the Catholic Church. Others just believed that this needed to be removed because they didn't see any real value in the Apocrypha. Yet the Bible that Father Miller used, the Bibles that Ellen Harmon 
and James White were using during the Millerite movement all contain the Apocrypha. Look at some of the early testimonies that were given by Mrs. White and by James White, and you will find that they both gave reference to many passages of the Apocrypha. Now, Ellen White was inspired of God, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. If she was willing and directed to make use of the Apocrypha, and if references to the Apocrypha were placed on both the 1843 and the 1850 charts, is it not worth our consideration that these portions should also continue to be studied. Remind, remind me where they're referenced on the charts again. Okay. If I turn here, and we're going to come into this on the 1843 chart, we have a reference to the book of Maccabees. Now, I'll use my other computer very quickly. When we're dealing with this, and we're looking for these, we're going to have a group of data that will tell us. Yeah, I move too quick with my mouse sometimes. It will show us that there are historical references in the chart itself. If you look at the reference under 158, it says time of the league between the Jews and the Romans, 158 years before Christ, 1st Maccabees, ninth chapter, verses 70 and 71. Now, is the League of the Jews and the Romans important for us to note today? Mm -hmm. Have we not been studying? Yeah. Are, Go ahead. Are you going to, to the other chart, too? Is there a reference on the 1850 chart? Okay. Again, the time of the League is repeated on the 1850 chart. Okay. You, okay. Yeah. Now, does that does that give answer Thanks. to your question? Yeah, I just needed to remi be reminded. I missed that somehow. Maccabees. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Not a problem. Now, we're going to continue in this and begin the verses with Ezekiel chapter nine. Now. Ezekiel chapter 9 is one chapter that I have found is very rarely openly studied in, within the church. I found it intriguing that some of the recent presentations that Elder Jeff had been doing gave reference to Ezekiel 9. Because most of these studies, I was being led to prepare on this months ago. So let us let us begin here in Ezekiel 9, verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Now, if we're looking at someone that has a destroying weapon, what is that saying to us? This is the only time in the Bible that this word mashkeath is used in the Bible. It, it, is, it suggests, it suggests okay. to me uh, uh, destroy or be destroyed. Uh, just a thought. Um, destroying weapon in his hand. We asked, we asked about being that person or something. Or having that weapon, you either destroy or be destroyed by it. Okay. Now, this, this word, Hebrew 4892. I'm, I'm sorry, Dwight. Wouldn't it be like um, God's word being the, um, doing this destroying? That's a possibility. But this word, Hebrew 4892, is taken from Hebrew 4889. Destructive, that is, as a noun literally or specifically a snare, or figuratively corruption. Cause them that have charge over the city. Is this not describing leadership? Yes. Okay. So this loud voice 
that Ezekiel is hearing. And if Ezekiel is typifying the movement at this time, then this loud voice is speaking to us, correct? I don't know could it, could it be speaking to the church of, you know, God's denominated people. And that uh, we are to cry with a loud voice to that, to the denominated people, the leadership. Does it necessarily have to be to this, you know, whatever movement you want to call it, the 2520 or whatever? Okay. Just an idea. Just an idea. Well, in understanding the seven... Uh, the other, uh, before, before I finish that question, I guess was a, a thought was... Uh, what did we figure out the destroying weapon is? Like you were in, it was an interesting definition there. You were reading of the alt word it came from or whatever. Is that, could that fit, you know, in the mouths of the leaders? Well, and then warning, warning them. Th this last week, as, as we had been studying, Brother Theodore was pointing out that the way that Hebrew is approached in this doesn't always mean it's approached the same way it would be in English. Now, I'm reading this verse. I'm hearing that the one that has brought Ezekiel into this vision is crying in Ezekiel's ears with a loud voice. Does that fit with the Hebrew? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. On that one, Theodore will answer that one for sure. But uh, is it this voice? Let's just say an angel is giving him a vision, with a loud voice to Ezekiel, get, telling Ezekiel to cause the leaders to draw near, even those that have a destroying weapon in his hand, or is are the people that are calling the leaders having the destroying weapon? Who does who has the weapon in their hand? Ezekiel or the leaders. Yeah. So, so I read this as those that charge over the sit have charge over the city. I'm not sure if that would be referring to um, the leaders. I would think that refers to the ones uh, that have the destroying weapons in in his hand. What I'm the reason I'm asking this question the way that I am. Because that word charge is visitation. These okay. are the these are visiting uh, the city. It, you could say um, cause them that that are visiting the city to draw near, even every man that has his destroying weapon in his hand. Okay. Are they visiting authorities? Like that word charge, you know, in the English it would throw us off. Then is that what you're saying? Because yeah, well. Well, yeah, but this is is uh, a visitation. This is that it's it's more a, a judicial sense. That yeah, yeah. Like visiting, so they're, they're, visiting they're giving a, judgment a, over this. Visiting a judgment. Yeah. Uh, punch buggy. So, in yeah. other words, yeah. If if they have, if they are visiting on an official basis. Mm -hmm. If they have oversight mm -hmm. of the city, could we also say that these are potentially wardens? Well, yeah, because it, it can refer to uh, um, oversight of a prison. So that would be a warden. But but in this case, the idea is that they're visiting the city in judgment. Right. Right. So, so it, it's not the leaders of the city that are being referred to. The ones that are being called to draw near are the ones with the destruction, destroying weapons in their hand. Good. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, yeah. nine. Anyone else? In the chat, it was brought up um, Exodus 32, 25 to 28, as a parallel to Ezekiel 9. Why? I'll read it to you. It says, uh, when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from
took the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So are we not supposed to be the children of Levi? All right. Is there not great, great, great idolatry among us and in the mainstream church? You may be very right. Now, the angel that cried in Ezekiel's ears, what angel would that be? Well, yes, it would be Gabriel. Right. And since Gabriel is making this statement, from whom is the statement originating? Well, uh, his it would angel be... is from God. Okay, Kelly, thank you. Well, William? Well, sorry to cut someone off. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing he just said. Okay, so if this is coming directly from God, it's coming from God to Christ to Gabriel. It, right? Don't we know this from, from the book of Revelation? Amen. So cause them that are visiting over the city to draw near. Every man with his destroying weapon, every man with his weapon of destruction in his hand. If we had, in a sense like this, if we had a group of soldiers surrounding us, all with automatic weapons in their hands, would we stop and listen to what they would have to say? I think we'd be running, wouldn't we? No, we might be running. You're right. But if we weren't able to run, would we be listening to what was being said? Probably not. Um, I would think we would be hiding in a panic um, first. <laughs> okay. But here we have a situation. God is giving a message, and it's a message that is going to go before the ancients of the house of Jerusalem, the ancients of the house of Israel. How often is this message being addressed? Is this not an end-time message that we need to pay attention with? Yeah, I've, in, in my experience over the years, I've seen uh, many attempts to give this kind of message to leadership or to, I don't know, to give messages of judgment and warning in the church over the years. That's about over 40 years now. And I haven't seen anyone do it in a way that was redemptive and successful and, and received in a received really. And, and it usually, it has a tendency to, to turn the mind into a fanatical bent. So this is one to really be careful with. I I kind of see where you're going, but no, it has not happened to answer your question in a short. Okay. Successfully. Now the next verse. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with the writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Now, six men, five and one. Would that be the correct way to look at this? No, there's six men. So the there's six men plus one? No, there's six men. But only one is denoted as being clothed with linen. Yeah. So we have five men that are not clothed with linen, one man that is clothed with linen. Yeah, I would assume so, based on, on, on what we, we did this study before, uh, about 10 years ago. Right. Maybe years ago. And, and I thought that there was six plus one, but I was corrected from a spirit of prophecy quote which I can't find right now. <laughs> but, uh, where, where you got in the verse, it says, it says, and one man among, they don't say um, one man separate, but it says one man among them was clothed with linen. So that right there should tell you that it was six, right? Right. 
I, I would agree with you. Yeah, and it actually yeah, means right. in, the midst, in the midst of of them. So there's one man in the midst of them. But, you know, I mean, it could have been that, you know, there's six and then there's one man that's that's separated out. But Ellen White's clear there's six. I just can't find the quote right now because I can't remember how she says it. So as this as this reads, and it goes into the alternate Hebrew, we have these six men. We have a division because one of those six men is clothed in linen. Is it possible that these five that are accompanying the sixth are represented by the five wise virgins? No. Okay. So, behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which is turned toward the north. And every man, a weapon of his breaking in pieces in his hand. So, the translators chose to use the word slaughter. What kind of weapon breaks things in pieces? Does a sword break things in pieces? That's that's what I was going to ask. What does it breaking in pieces in the right. hands? <clears throat> well, that's what uh, the the Hebrew word that's translated is. It means a shattering type of weapon. It shatters. Um, it comes from the word nafatz, which means to dash to pieces, to scatter, to be beaten in sunder, break in pieces, broken, dash in pieces. So it's definitely not a sword. Could this be a hand? Wouldn't I'm sorry, Dwight? Wouldn't wouldn't it? You know, years ago I used I uh, I gave up my guns and took up the Bible. And to me, that's always been a. To me, the Bible is a weapon, in a way, it not to to fight against you know to fight against um, error, right? Yeah, but this isn't that's this, the way this, I was looking at it. I mean, I don't yeah, know. If it, yeah, so this is not a sword. This is not the Bible. This is a destroying weapon, right? So so we have two different words that are going to be used. He's going to have a destroying weapon, which means destruction. That's going to be uh, uh, based upon, uh, uh, you know, this idea of a snare or corruption, right? It means like a, something that destroys utterly. And then you have the slaughter weapon. It's just describing the same weapon, but that it's going to smite into pieces or it's going to shatter into pieces. So so in this case, it's not the word of God that's causing this destruction. That's not the weapon that's being referred to. Okay. Now, the translators gave reference to the following verses. When we're looking at this phrase, a slaughter weapon or a weapon of his breaking in pieces, when this was presented, the first of those verses was Leviticus 16.4, stating, he shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and the linen miter shall be attired. These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Now, now this is more in reference to and one. Correct. One man among them, right? So it's not right. referring to the weapon itself, just one man among them. Correct. So it, it references us here to the high priest on the day of atonement. Correct. Now, Ezekiel 10, which we are also bidden to read by Sister White, and he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, go in between the wheels, even under the cherub and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims and scatter them over the city. And he went in in my sight, Ezekiel 10, 6 and 7. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, take fire from the wheels from between the cherubims, then he went in and stood between beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof 
and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. This man clothed with linen is receiving fire. Yeah, that he's going to scatter over the city. Okay. Now they're comparing this with Revelation 15, 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breast girded, girded with golden girdles. Why is it that in Revelation 15, these seven angels are clothed in pure and white linen? Is this not the symbol of righteousness? Now, a couple of things that were quoted and placed into the chat. The first, the mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done. Now the angel of death goeth forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons, to whom the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary, says the prophet. They began at the ancient men which were before the house. Ezekiel 9, 1 to 6. The work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. The Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26, 21. In the mad strife of their own fierce passions and by the awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath, fall the wicked inhabitants of the earth, priests, rulers, people, rich and poor, high and low. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth unto the other end of the earth. They shall be lamented, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. Jeremiah 25, 33, and 42, quoted from the Great Controversy, pages 656, 657. Also from the chat, Jeremiah 51, destruction of Babylon, specifically from verses 20 through 23. Now, in this situation, as we are addressing and have addressed this from Ezekiel 9, we have a scene that is coming before us. We have a question as to what the representation is here. Further from the chat, comment is made, they were not even to even come near. So they went in and they stood beside the brazen altar. This is the thought that we're going to return to this coming week. All of this directly is showing us that this final message is to begin first before those that have placed themselves as the champions of God, but that have not done the work that God would have them to do. If they are not doing the work that God would have them to do, then where are we going to find a description of the work that God would have done and that he approves? Consider that as well for this coming week. Any other questions or thoughts at this time? So what I'm, what I'm getting from this, uh, from Ellen White's comments on Ezekiel 9 is it's Armageddon or is that the, uh, Editor's idea. Uh, type said, chapter editor's title idea. In. Yeah, yeah. So would we place this after the close of probation then? I'm thinking. Or, or, and, 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 and the, the men that go forth with slaughtering weapons r- represent the angel of death. So th- this is a work that the, that God does. It's not a work that is put into our hands. Like that's where the, uh, who are those guys again, Theodore, that 
go off into Shepherd's Rock or Shepherd's someone. Rock. Shepherd's Rock. I think they're literally going to fulfill it. So, yeah, okay. So this is but, God, but before the close of probation or sure. after, I guess. This is part of a message that needs to be given prior to the close of probation, I would think. Well, the message is given. I mean, the warning is given, but the, the slaughter happens after the close of probation. Okay. So now, be prepared this coming week. We're going to be returning to this portion of Ezekiel. Do your homework. Prepare for what we need to address. And... Have your thoughts ready, because the next few verses are going to be very important for us to understand. Shall we now close in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you so that we may be truly converted. Help us now so that we may understand the steps that are necessary so that this message that you would have given to this world may go out and be given in the manner in which you would see it to be given. Help me now, Father, help us all to listen, to learn, and to understand that that you would have us to do. May your will be done. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon the meeting that is to follow this one. Show us, Father, what we need to know. Be with us now. For this we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.